Good morning everyone, welcome back to the Savanac Forest on Oak Apple Day, May the 29th. An occasion now almost entirely receded from folk memory, but which my mother remembered being the day when boys at school used to chase the girls and try and sting them with nettles, uh, which would rather linger in the memory, I suspect. Oak Apple Day was, as you may know, the day when uh, for couple of hundred years at least was a public holiday for the restoration of the monarchy. Charles II had hid reputedly in an oak tree at the end of the Civil War and his return to England was greeted, Macaulay writes, with the gutters flowing with ale, a uh, day of great celebration. And I'm here at the Cathedral Oak, a tree that would uh, certainly have been uh, fully grown at the time of the restoration uh, in 1660. It is one of the great oaks of the Savanac and you can see because it its trunk doesn't really end <laughs> even though I'm moving past it the sunlight is so bright this morning but this is the one of which I wrote that it had a hide like Dura's rhinoceros. Do you remember the piece that I uh, read earlier in the week? The Cathedral Oak. Grand old tree. So I thought I would read uh, another piece about uh, the monarchy and national life and Christian faith and the intersection of those. Uh, it's called Due Mon I wrote it in February, uh, which is barely, well, it's three months ago, but feels like another lifetime. Rivers silver the fields, and every forded lane conceals a range of jarring potholes this grim and unrelenting rain seems to have been with us since September. Buffeted by Sunday's alphabetical storm, I'm beginning to think a barge would have been a better bet than my low-lying Volvo. Completing the slalom, I turn up at Great Durnford for their 10.30 service. Even by this county's standards, St Andrew's Church is exceptionally well preserved for fittings and furniture. One could call it a time capsule, except that each of these items, Cromwellian pulpit, sciatica inflaming 14th century pews, a 900 year old font, is being used for its original purpose, so there is an unbroken chain of memory and practice. Whatever else they are, village churches are not museums. And on the north wall, an unfaded royal coat of arms, dated 1678, bearing the legend, Fear God, Honour the King, and listing the church wardens of that year, including one John Pyle, whose surname reappears on the Roll of Honour for the Great War, all those years later. These boards are a common feature of older parish churches, often so age-darkened they display only an outline of lion or a smudge of unicorn. They remain as an emblem of the compact between church and state, parish and nation. Some were installed as embroidered hangings after Henry VIII's break with Rome, many more after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, badging an era when as Linda Colley puts it in her fine book, Britons, Protestantism was the foundation that made the invention of Great Britain possible. The curse of British Christianity, also at times its blessing, is that it has proved so politically useful. Surprisingly, enduringly so, from its early expression as the integrating principle behind the merger of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, through the vagaries of the English Revolution, when Protestantism became the defining validation of the British nation against Catholic Europe, through to providing the moral underpinnings of the welfare state, still the clearest articulation of, albeit secularised, homegrown Christian socialism. It's hard to avoid the fact that at each step change, the church not simply provided divine sanction, sanction for monarchic or political interest, but much more significantly, I think, gave narrative meaning to national destiny. As Britishness emerged as a coherent idea in the 18th century, 
Royal Britannia, for example, was composed in 1740, with the national anthem appearing five years later, sung in a London theatre to ecstatic encores. The Church of England reinforced the new social contract like a Hessian-backed map. Perhaps Edmund Burke was right in reflecting that we averted revolution on the French scale through the strength of this association at the local level, so bluntly hammered into the wall here at Great Durnford. Yet the cost of this conscription into the national cause has been severe, allying military success with the will of God, justifying the crimes of empire and slavery, and a deep investment in commercial profit and landed wealth. More radical visions of the Christian nation have tended to emerge from, say, Milton, Morris or Temple, only when the church re-engages with the narrative arc of scripture, rather than all too plastic notions of providence that appear to bless us without qualification. Eschatology may sound unhinged, but is our exit from nationalism. A nation, wrote Ernest Renan, is a soul, a spiritual principle. It is also, he added, a daily plebiscite that requires the ongoing assent of its people to a common idea. We have little idea of Britain at the present time and enough of plebiscites to last us a lifetime. But if the church is to inform the new national polity, it must decide how to be useful and at what cost. That feels quite pertinent this week. And I was looking under the boughs of the Cathedral Oak for some oak apples. Oak apples are the little nut-like growths under the leaves, which are the gall of, the, uh, of a wasp, I think, the larvae of a gall wasp. Can't find any for you, but uh, I shall take some pictures of this glorious spot and put them on the Instagram feed. May God bless you today, friends, as you go to ground.